Hi, my name is Mark, and you're about to watch a message that was preached at Calvary Fellowship in Miramar, Florida. At Calvary, we exist to help people take their next step with God. And today, it is our prayer that this message does just that. So, how is everyone doing this fine morning? It's great to see you. So, uh, I'm going back now, 2009, so it's probably about six years ago or so. Um, I bought the Kindle, the Amazon Kindle, when it first came out. Some of you know what in the world I'm talking about. Okay, you know, it's like the first tablet, not tablets of stone, but a tablet kind of thing. Anyway, this was like before the iPad came out and all that. And uh, the cool thing is I read a lot of books. I probably read about 100 books a year. And so my wife got really sick of me having a nightstand with several books on top and then a pile with about 10 or 20 books on top. And uh, so she's, she's like, you know, you should really get this and then you can keep everything, all the, you know, 1,500 books in this little device. And so I got it. And it, I'll be honest with you, it was pretty awesome. It was the first kind of tablet thing I ever uh, owned. And then after I got one, uh, Pastor Mark got one because he was guilty of the sin of coveting. And um, so after that, he got one. But see, what he did, he's like, hey, did you order the case? And I'm like, no, man, I, just, I love how it looks. Like, and he's like, yeah, but, you know, you have kids. And uh, kids will knock stuff over. I said, no, well, your kids, my, my kids are obedient. And, um, and so uh, anyway, so one night, this is, this is the... Um, whatever the night that was, say like a, I think it was like a Thursday, that he had gotten his in the mail. And then um, that evening, I come home, I'm sitting on the couch, and I'm reading the, my Kindle. And uh, I put it down, and then Mia, who was about two and a half at the time, um, she picks up a pillow uh, to throw it at me as a joke. Well, she doesn't realize that as she picks up the pillow that the Kindle is right next to that. So she picks the thing up, throws it at me. The Kindle uh, slips off the couch, face first, onto our wood floor and like cracks the whole thing uh, in, in, you know, a million pieces. And uh, anyway, the Kindle went to be with Jesus that night. And, um, and, and man, I was so mad uh, be- that that happened. And really, there's only one person I could blame, and that was Mark. Uh, because the same day that he mentioned the case, it broke. And, uh, but now, here's the thing. is that I bet all of us, if we, if we kind of went around the room, like, hey, have you ever been given good advice that you didn't take? Yeah, yeah, I did that. I just happened on the way here. Uh, you know, like all of us have had that moment. We've, someone gives us wisdom. Someone gives us good advice. We didn't take it. And then we suffer the consequences of that. The very thing that the person said would happen is the very thing that happened. There's this passage that I love in Proverbs uh, that says this. I put it in your notes. It says, the wise see danger ahead and avoid it, but fools keep on going and get into trouble. You see, this is one of the many times in my life that I wish that uh, I had listened to the wisdom that was given to me, uh, and I would have been much better off. And, and once again, all of us have had that experience where we've been given wisdom, given good advice, and we didn't take it. And once again, the result was disaster. And what I love about the Bible is that it gives us timeless wisdom. Whether it's um, a principle that we're reading, whether it's a song in the Psalms or something that we're saying, whether it's a story and there's, and there's um, a, a, just a, a nugget of wisdom in there, um, it's God teaching us how best to live. And so if you ever want, like, you know, we always talk about wisdom. What is wisdom? Right? Here's my definition of wisdom. Wisdom is the application of God's word in all that we say or do. Uh, and, and here's the thing, because when we think about the wisdom of God and how it's, you know, I mean, thousands of years, and it's like, it's still true. Like that proverb that we just read, the, danger see tr- the, the, the wise see danger ahead and avoid it. Fools keep on going and get in trouble. That was true when it was written. It was true yesterday. It's, gonna, it's true today. It's still going to be true tomorrow. But I think that all of us would, would agree that there are other people that try to come up with like wise phrases and sayings that really don't make any sense. There are sayings like these little pithy axioms that people come up with that really haven't held up over the course of time. Um, and in fact, I, I was talking to someone recently, and, and we were, they were talking about, uh, they, they were like, oh, you know, I slept like a baby. And I'm like, what does that even mean? And I'm like, because the person who made that saying up is an idiot. Because, why? Because obviously they had no kids. How does a baby actually sleep? So if someone were to say, I slept like a baby, it means, oh, so you were tossing and turning all night, waking up and waking up everyone around you? That's what slept like a baby should mean. But instead it's like, oh no, I slept so calm and peaceful throughout the night. What baby does that? Right? Or, or this one, you, you ever had, uh, and by the way, if you don't have kids, you're like, borrow a baby for a weekend and then you will, 
you will agree. Like, wow, Bob was right. Uh, and then there's this one. I've never understood this one. Like, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> I've been doing that my whole life. Right? Like, every time I buy a cake, I have my cake, and then I eat it too, mostly of the time, by myself. I mean, that, right? But it's like, and I, to this day, I still don't really understand what that means, but people say that, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure I can. In fact, after lunch, I'm going to make sure that I can. And, um, or then, or there's this one. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Oh, but that, that's a piece of cake. Like, that's supposed to mean that something is easy. Have you ever tried to bake a cake? I did once, and I almost burned down my house. And so I'm saying, you know what? A piece of cake is not a piece of cake. That's what I've learned. And, uh, you know, what the box should say, what the saying should be is, um, are you able to bake a cake? Can you follow the directions on the back of the box and bake a cake? Well, yes. Well, then this should be easy. You know, uh, and, and, but, or, or there's this. You ever, you ever um, if you were a server at one point in your life, and you know this, like someone orders something, like, oh, I'd like a salad and uh, with blah, blah, blah. But, you know, can I have no onions? And then they write on the menu. You ever see this? They write 86 onions. Now, if you're a normal person and you're reading that, what do you think that means? This person wants 86 rings of onions. That's like an onion lover. But in fact, what 86 onions means, they don't want any onions. Shouldn't the person write zero onions? But instead, they write 86 onions, and 86 onions really means zero onions. See, this is the madness of why things don't hold up, right? It just doesn't make any sense. And, and so uh, the thing that, once again, is amazing about the Bible to me is that it's once it, stood, it stood the test of time. It is just as relevant and true today as it was uh, back when it was written because there is wisdom from the Bible that can speak in almost any situation. I was having a conversation with a girl uh, this past week, and um, she was uh, talking to me about kidney stones. And uh, I don't know if you've ever had a kidney stone. I have never had a kidney stone, thank God. My younger sister has had kidney stones several times. And uh, after seeing, like, the writhing pain that she was in, by the way, anything that could be solved with drink more water is totally avoidable. But anyway, so, uh, but, so I've, never got, I've never gotten them, thank God, uh, because I, I like to drink water. And uh, so the girl says to me, Pastor Bob, do you have a scripture for kidney stones? for me to think about. And I thought, you know, I mean, I, I didn't really, I wasn't sure. I mean, you know, I was trying to come up with something, and I said, you know what, yes I do. In Genesis chapter 24, verse one, just the first part, here's what you have to, just meditate on this, here's what the Bible says, and it came to pass. <laughs> That's all you gotta think about. It came to pass. Pass that stone in Jesus' name. So, anyway. <laughs> So anyway, so you got, you know, whatever, we'll, we'll uh, I, you know, I, this happened to my brother-in-law, he had his, t- his foot hurt the other day, and, um, but anyway, I don't want to get into that, but, uh, but no, it's seriously, his, his foot hurt, and then I said, I said, listen, I told my sister-in-law, tell, tell Jim that I'm praying for him, and tell him that um, Asa became diseased in his feet, and he didn't seek the Lord, and he was defeated, all right, so anyway, <laughs> so there you go, use that one, you can use that, that's, that's, that's not copyrighted. You can use it. Um, all right, so three weeks ago, we started this series called Second Chances. We're working our way through the book of Ruth, and we've been following this family that has gone through terrible tragedy and hardship. Um, those of you that are like, uh, you know, what's going on? I, it, it might feel like I walked into the middle of a movie. So let me just give you the little recap, you know, previously on Second Chances, and I'll tell you that, and then that'll kind of get you up to speed. So this family is living in Israel. In fact, they're living in the city of Bethlehem. There's a famine in the land. They decide to leave. This guy named Elimelech and his, um, his wife and his two sons, they move to an area called Moab, which was a very bad neighborhood uh, back then in the Middle East, and today in the Middle East, still a bad neighborhood. And so uh, they move to Moab, and then Elimelech dies. The two boys get married, and the, then the two boys die. And so now Naomi, who's the wife, is left with her two daughters-in-law. She says to the two daughters-in-law, go home. Go back to your father's house, remarry, and rebuild your life. One of them, whose name is Orpah, says, okay, and then she goes home. Ruth says, no, I don't want, I don't want to go. So she goes back with 
Naomi to Bethlehem, back to Israel where their, where their home is. They get there, uh, they get back to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest, which is very, they, once again, they left because there was a famine. They come back, and now it's harvest time. There's all kinds of food, all kinds of grain, uh, and so it's a very, very good time. And so um, the daughter-in-law, then Ruth, has to go out and glean some, uh, glean some grain for them to eat, and so she shows up on this field, just so happens and to be the field of this guy by the name of Boaz. Boaz is this wealthy older guy who happens to be a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. She's a relative of Elimelech's. And uh, so this is going to be important uh, later in our study, but that's an important thing to know. But the thing that I love about uh, this chapter in Ruth is that Ruth is going to be given wisdom. She's going to be given wisdom by her mother-in-law, Naomi. She's going to be given wisdom by uh, Boaz and, and, and what she should do. And what I love about Ruth in this chapter is, is that she's just, um, she, she, she receives the wisdom and the instruction. She's not proud. Instead, she's very teachable. Uh, the, and that's, I think, the best part of it. She's going to hear the wisdom. She's going to take it. And the result is going to be the decision that she's wanted to see happen. And that's one of the things that I really believe is, is so good for us because if you've ever been in a place where you've needed a second chance, right, it's because the first chance didn't go so well. And so now this message is going to be helpful for us if you've ever needed a second chance because we're going to see the, the people that God wants to bring into your life to help you the wisdom that God wants to bring into your life to instruct you. And all of that is available. Listen, if we're open to it, we can actually leave the past behind, actually get a second chance, and have uh, the second chance be much different than what happened in the first. So I'm going to invite you to open with me to the book of Ruth, chapter 3. That's where we're going to begin. And uh, Ruth 3, and here's where we begin. Ruth, verse 1. It says, Then Naomi, uh, her mother-in-law, Ruth's mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it might be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself, anoint yourself, put on your best garment, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. Now if you pause there, and give me your attention. Uh, here's the first thing that we want. If, if you want to put the past behind you, here's the first thing. All right, if you're taking notes. Number one, I need to be open to listening. Open to listening. Naomi is giving Ruth instructions about how to approach Boaz. And, and I'm going to talk about the reason in a moment. So I'm going to kind of punt that right now. And I want to just focus on uh, her, uh, the fact that Ruth is open to receiving instruction. And I want to tell you that one of the greatest qualities that you can develop as a person and, and certainly as um, someone who's following Jesus as a Christian is being teachable. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs, I put in your notes, it says rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. I mean, think about that. God says that being corrected strongly, which is what being rebuked is, being corrected strongly, if you're wise is more effective than a fool being smacked a hundred times over. I mean, they just will not learn. And listen, like all of us make mistakes, and I will certainly recognize some of us more than others. Um, but every single one of us makes mistakes. The key is, do we learn from them, right? Um, we were, uh, my family and I, we were in Virginia Beach. I was speaking at a conference a few weeks ago, and uh, my wife was taking my youngest daughter, Olivia, uh, who's three, to the bathroom. And so she sees the bathroom, she walks in, and she, she comes out. I mean, her face is just white, you know, as a ghost. And she, I'm like, what happened? She's like, you know, I went into the bathroom, and uh, I went into the stall, and it was just disgusting. And so I went into the next stall, and the next stall was even worse. And then I went into the next stall, and it was a urinal. And I said to myself, I'm in the men's room. <laughs> and uh, so, so she leaves, and uh, she's like, so I just ran out. And uh, now, is there a point to that? Not really. I just think that story is hilarious. Uh, but, the, right, right, but so people make mistakes, right? And then, once again, sometimes people make mistakes so that we can laugh at the expense of others. Uh, not really. Uh, but here's the thing, right? Like, this, was ne this will never happen again, right? Because she's like, you know, could you imagine if somebody was in? Anyway, it's like my wife's going through, like, every scenario that could have happened. And so, but so, so now she goes in and she, she's like, 
you know, where exactly is the sign posted? You know, is it posted like right on the door? Is it next to the door? If it's next to the door, you're not really sure if that's the right door. So she's like very careful now. And, and so here, here's the thing um, is that so many people, right, we, we, we never change many times because we don't learn from the mistakes that we've made. And that's what separates the foolish from the wise. You know, it was Socrates who said that the unexamined life is not worth living. And why is that? And the reason is, is because people always talk about, you know, experience is the best teacher. And can I say that maybe there's one better than that? And it's not just experience is the best teacher, but evaluated experience is the best teacher. Because it's only when we reflect on the choices that we make, the lifestyle that we're living, the patterns that we're forming, that we can make corrections and change. And so listen, we are blessed when God brings a wise person into our lives and then speaks wisdom to us. In Proverbs chapter 12, it says this. It says, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Here's what that means. If you're engaged, um, uh, can, I, can I tell you this? Or maybe you're newly married and uh, you want to be happily married, let me give you a little piece of advice. Here's what you do. You take a couple out to lunch that's happily married and you just grill them with questions. And it's like, so how do you do this? And how do you do this? And what happens when this? And, 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 and all of that. Because if you don't learn from others, then we're doomed to repeat all, all the, just all that we know. And so, uh, so when my wife and I were getting married, I listened to everything. I, whatever pastor there was out there that had a series on marriage, um, I bought it. I, I met with people who were married that I, I, I respected their marriage. And I'm like, man, these people seem really happy. How do we meet with them and talk to them? Because here's the thing. In my family, or bo- actually, both my wife and I, um, b- both of our parents are divorced multiple times over. Um, you know, every aunt and uncle in my family is divorced. Um, every single aunt and uncle in my family, both sides are, are all divorced. Parents divorced multiple times over. And so I'm going in, not at an, I'm going in at a severe disadvantage, right? Because I've never seen what a healthy marriage looks like. I've never been part of a family that has a healthy marriage. And so once again, I'm getting married and uh, I'm not trying to ask my family anything, right? I didn't even invite those people to the wedding, you know? No. <laughs> But what happens is, right, you want to learn from couples who have a marriage that you admire. And so what I did is I just wanted to get around couples uh, who, have, who have great marriages. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not interested in the guy. You know, I've been married eight times. Let me tell you what I've learned. It's like, you know what, just don't even say it because it might stick, you know. Because uh, d- that guy doesn't have much to tell you. Unless you're looking for a divorce attorney, then he probably has an excellent one because he's done, you know, he's got like a repeat business, you know, like a, card that he punches because like you know after four times the fifth one's free and uh, so one of those deals but so so here's what happens Naomi tells Ruth here's what you need to do if you I, I want to seek some security for you for your future so here's what I want you to do I want you to put on all your your best stuff and I want you to go and this is exactly how I want you to do it and then what happens next look at what happens verse six and it's pretty amazing It says, so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly, uncovered his feet, and laid down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled, and he uh, turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she said, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, For you are a close relative. And then she said, uh, then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning. In that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now, it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative to you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lay down until morning. Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, here's the second thing. And that is, if I want to put the past behind me, once again, i got to be open to listening. Number two, I need to follow God's word. Follow God's word. Now, uh, let me explain what's happening here in the story, because I recognize that it can be a little... Uh, misleading. Um, and, and let me tell you what it is by telling you what it's not. This is not Ruth. So she says, you know, because you read it at, at first glance, it's like, so uh, Naomi says, why don't you put on, you know, take a shower, put on some really nice clothes, and then wait until, you know, uh, Boaz has a couple of drinks in him, and he's got, he's had dinner, 
and then you go over to him, and then you uncover his feet, and then lay down next to him, and then in the middle of the night, you know, and, and it's like, well, what, what exactly? So this is her, like, putting on whatever it is, the equivalent of, like, Victoria's Secret, and, uh, you know, so it's like, oh, this is from England. It's like, you know, Caesar's Secret, uh, or, or I guess it would be uh, Pharaoh's Secret. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Caesar's Secret would come along later uh, after the introduction of his salad. Uh, so anyway, and so, you know, and then so she kind of uncovers it. And she's like, what's a nice guy like you doing at a threshing floor like this? And, uh, and so now <laughs> that's not exactly what's happening. That's kind of a different version. Uh, and so now, but it's, it's so, so much deeper than what, than what we would think, right? So she's not trying to seduce Boaz in any way. She's asking for something much bigger, all right? She is asking Boaz, and if you notice, she says to him, um, in, uh, this is in verse 9, she says, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your, uh, take your maidservant under your wing. The Hebrew word there is kanaf, uh, which is where, like the shawl uh, that, that uh, Jews would wear, for you are a close relative. Okay, she is asking Boaz to be her in the Hebrew, what is called the Goel, uh, or the kinsman redeemer. What is that? All right, I got to give you a little bit of background uh, to, to understand what, what's going on. Okay, when the children of Israel came into the land of promise, all right, the, 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 the promised land, um, God gave them an allotment of land. Every tribe got an allotment of land of all uh, the 12 tribes. But the, re- the thing is this, the land, land in Israel could not be sold permanently. Uh, it had to stay within each tribe. And that's because God told them that the land was actually not theirs. The land was his. And over and over throughout the Old Testament, God says, this is my land that I am giving to you. And so it's his land, and they were to steward the land that he had given to them. So now, because the land had to stay within each tribe, God instituted something uh, that was called the Jubilee year. Now every, so that means that every 50 years, uh, everything would revert back to its original owner. So you could say, oh, I sell this land for X amount of dollars, but at the 50th year, at the year of Jubilee, all debts would be canceled, and then all land and possessions would go back to their original owner. And so selling the land really would be what we would consider a lease because people would only, let's say it was the year after Jubilee, uh, you can only own it for 49 years. Uh, because eventually, at the 50th year, everything would revert back to its original owner. And so, uh, and if you, once again, you read the, the, the passages in, in when God establishes all this in Leviticus, um, it, everything, all leases or sales were based on how far or close to Jubilee it was. So if Jubilee is a week away, then you're not going to get a whole lot of money for selling your land because that person's only going to get it for a week. If it's 20 years away, then you're going to get more if you kind of follow what's, what's happening there. So, um, because once again, at the Jubilee, all debts were canceled. Everybody got a fresh start. Everybody got a second chance uh, to start over. And uh, so that, wouldn't that be just, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm like for this. I, whatever petition needs to be signed to institute that, I'm with that. Because could you imagine that like, you know, whatever year it is, um, somebody, you know, your mortgage company sends you a letter, hey, stop paying us. It's Jubilee. We're good. You know, like that's what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? Uh, so, you know, American Express, hey, we're, we'll just call it even. And like, Membership does have its privileges. And so, you know, you're with that. And so, now, but what happens is, what happens if you sell your land and it's 40 years until Jubilee? Is that what you would have to do is, and you didn't have the money to buy your land back. Now you're stuck. Is that what, so what you would have to do is you would, there would have to be someone in your family that could serve as your goel. That would be your, uh, your kinsman, that is someone of your family, and then the redeemer. Uh, or what is called the, the goel in, in Hebrew. And so that would be the person that would buy back the land. But it makes it, uh, so let me read you the passage. It's a, little, it's a little more complicated here, but let me read you the passage, then I'll explain the other part. It says, with every sale of land, there must be a stipulation that the land can be redeemed at any time. If any of your Israel, Israelite relatives go bankrupt and are forced to sell some inherited land, then a closer relative, a kinsman redeemer, may buy it back for them. If there is no one to redeem the land, but the person who sold it manages to get enough money to buy it, then the person has the right to redeem it from the one who bought it. The price of the land will be based on the number of years until the next year of Jubilee. After buying it back, the original owner may return to the land, but if the original owner cannot afford to redeem it, then it will belong to the new owner until the next year of Jubilee, and in the Jubilee year, the land will return to the original owner. So, in the case of, in our story, we have a famine in the land in the beginning of the story, and so more than likely what happens is, is that Elimelech sells his land to finance the trip to Moab. 
Well, now all this disaster happens, and then they return back, and Naomi and Ruth return back with nothing because they return back home to Bethlehem, but they don't have enough money to redeem the land. And so she instructs Ruth to ask Boaz, will you be our kinsman redeemer and redeem the land? But there's one other problem. If you were with us in our first study, we talked about uh, this, um, this thing that was called the law of the Leverite marriage. And uh, that is that, let's say, um, if, you're, um, if, you, if, you're, if you're married to someone and your, your husband dies and um, you don't have any children, his brother would marry you and would fulfill the duty of a husband to, to, to you and so that you, so that you could have a child. And then the first son that you bore would actually be credited to the brother who had passed away so that his lineage would continue uh, in Israel. And so that way, uh, so, so that's why your, your brothers were always concerned about, you know, who the other brother married. Because he's like, hey, I'm not getting involved with that situation if something happens to you. And, uh, well, you know, I really like her. Well, then you better be taking vitamins because I'm not involved in this situation. If, you know, something happens, you know, maybe our other brother will, but I'm not getting involved. So anyway, so, but here's, here's where it gets tricky. The land was Elimelech's. Elimelech sells the land. So the, now the inheritance would go to his sons because his sons would be able to redeem the, the land. But his sons died. And so now they don't have anyone who's able uh, to, to, to redeem the land. And so now, and, and by the way, if you redeem the land, you are standing in the place of Malon and Chilion, who are the children of Elimelech. Now you have to take Ruth as your wife so that you can raise up uh, a... a, a raise up a, a, a child for, for, for the sake of uh, genealogy for, your, uh, for, for, for his family. So it's not just redeeming the land now. You've got to redeem the land and take the place of this uh, child who's, uh, who's died, or you know, this grown-up uh, son who's died, and now you've got to marry uh, his, his, um, his wife. And so, and so this, is the cha- this is what Ruth is at. So she shows up, she uncovers his feet. Like, why does she do that? Because once again, in chapter four, it's gonna make a little more sense because there's this whole thing about taking off your shoe and all that. And if you, and if you uh, don't do this, then you're known as, check it out, the man whose sandal was taken off. And that might not sound like much here. But back then, if you were known as the man, man whose sandal was taken off in Israel, they're like, do you know anything about that guy? No, what about him? His sandal was taken. What? He seemed like such an upstanding citizen. Well, (laughs) you haven't seen the sandal that was taken off, and it was horrible. You know, anyway. So anyway, so that's kind of what was happening. We'll talk about all that next time. And uh, very exciting about the sandal being taken off. Believe it, it really is. And as as odd as it sounds, but so here's the thing that happens: is that um, she uncovers his feet. You know why? Because you ever notice that when you're sleeping, and then someone takes the covers off of you. Uh, which is what happens to me like, you know, 80 times a night, you know, like I wake up, I have no covers on me and my wife is wrapped up like a chalupa uh, in, on the on the covers. You know what I mean? Like she's spun in there, you know, and I'm like, so I'm, I'm trying to like pull this thing back, you know, and uh, and, I, and so what I do is I say, honey, let's just just buy, I just want to buy my own comforter. And she's like, I don't think that's good for our marriage. It's like causing a separation in our marriage. I'm like, I don't think it's a separation. I think it's just I'm going to sleep better. And, uh, and she's like, well, no, I, 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 don't, I don't feel comfortable. Anyway, so that's why I'm freezing all the time. So, and, uh, so anyway, word to the wise. There's nothing wrong with having a separate comfort. I'm not trying to, like, move into a new home. I just want to be in the same. I just want to have, like, my own stuff. Anyway, whew, I'm just glad I got that off my chest. Thank you so much. I really, I feel a lot better. And... Uh, so anyway, so that's what Ruth, Ruth she uncovers his feet because she knows he's going to wake up. She's going to be there, and then she's going to be able to essentially pop the question like, hey, could you, um, you know, buy a piece of land for me and also marry me and have a son so that uh, my former husband's uh, family could continue? I mean, not a big ask at all. Uh, and, you know, it's just like, okay, I'm committing the rest of my life to this. Thank you. I'm just glad we had this conversation in the middle of the night when I was half asleep. And uh, so anyway, so, that's, so he says, yes, I'll do it. But he says, but there's a relative that's actually closer than I am. 
And so the way it would work is that whoever's the closest relative would have the first option to redeem the land. And so that'll be the whole drama in chapter 4. But Ruth, once again, she follows the instruction. She follows the instruction that she's given exactly the way that it is in the law. And, and here's the point. And this is the thing that's so important for us, right, is that um, she doesn't actually look at God's commands as God's suggestions. And this is the difference between when, when things work out well or when things work out horrible. Um, it's because we just, you know, you, you look on and you say, well, should I do that? Well, I'm going to take what the Bible says under advisement. And, and then there's another, um, and that's when things usually end up going haywire. And then there's another thing that says, you know what, I'm just going to do, uh, I'm going to do what God says because I just really believe that his perspective is better than mine. I, I believe that his plan is better than mine. And uh, his, his, his um, ability to see the future is certainly better than mine. And so what ends up taking place is, is that because every time that we've made foolish decisions, it's because when we've seen God's commands as simply suggestions. And uh, Ruth doesn't do that. She says, this is exactly how you, Naomi says, this is what the Bible says, do it just like that. Then she asks him, and, 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 and it just starts working out. Now look at what happens in verse 14. Um, I love this part. It says this. It says, so she lay at his feet until morning, and arose before one could recognize another. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, early mor- real early morning. Um, and then he said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And also he said, bring the shawl that is on you and, and hold it. And when she held it, she, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid, it, uh, and laid it on her. And then she went into the city. And then she came to her mother-in-law and she said, is that you, my daughter? And then she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, these six ephahs of barley he gave me, for he said, do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. And then she said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Now, I want you to notice something, and this is the thing that I find so interesting, and this is uh, the third point in the message, and that is if I want um, to put the past behind me, here's what I have to do. I have to trust God's plan. And, and the, the, the crazy part to me is that um, because we're not part of this culture, uh, we miss what Boaz is saying to Naomi. Because I want you to, it, it is interesting that he gives her six ephahs of uh, barley. And then she presents, uh, Ruth pre- presents the six ephahs of barley and says, Boaz says, don't go empty-handed, so here are the six ephahs of barley. And then Naomi looks and she says, don't worry, he won't rest until the matter is resolved. And it's like, it just tells me that it's like, there's something here that we're not getting, right? Because she sees that there's a message being sent, and sometimes we miss it, right? Because once again, we're not part of that culture. It's like what happens with my kids. My, my, daughter, uh, my daughter, Mia, who's eight, is a total literalist. Um, I mean, she just takes, she takes everything very literally. I like to joke around, and so sometimes uh, she doesn't understand what I'm joking around about, or she takes what I'm saying the wrong way. And so, like, when she was younger, she asked us one night, and she's like, um, uh, can I have cereal for dinner? And then her mom said no, and I said yes. Uh, and, and so Carrie's like, well, why would, you, why would you say yes? Cereal is not good for dinner. And I'm like, who in the world said that? Cereal for dinner is like one of the five best things about being an adult, right? It's like going to Cracker Barrel and have, like, I've, I don't think I've ever even eaten the regular food at Cracker Barrel. I've always had breakfast at Cracker Barrel because it's just, you know, I just do it like, just like I see it in the Bible. And, uh, you know, and, and, but it's just, I, I love breakfast for dinner. I don't know if anybody else likes breakfast for dinner, but I, once again, thank you, I, one of us. Well, anyway, we'll go after. And, uh, and so, what, so what happens is, is that, so I say, yes, it's okay, because I love cereal for dinner, and uh, so I tell Mia what we have, and so she, I'm like, oh, we have Frosted Flakes. We, we, really, we don't actually have Frosted Flakes, because that would be too easy. We have whatever Whole Foods equivalent of Frosted Flakes is, and, um, which means that it costs three times as much, but it's half as good, so that's something. And, uh, so, and so I say to her, I'm like, well, okay, you can have, you know, the Frosted Flakes or whatever the thing was called, and I said, but, you know, you're going to have to eat the whole box. And uh, just messing around. And I'm like, you're going to have to eat the whole box. And then she starts to cry. And she's like, Debbie, you know I don't like the taste of cardboard. And I'm like, that's not what I mean. You know what I mean? You ever have, like, that's not what I mean. And then I, expl- I have to explain to her. And then uh, this is the thing every once in a while is that I'll say something. And then Mia will look at me funny. And then Carrie will actually say to Mia, it's an idiom. And she's like, you're joking, aren't you? I'm like, 
Yes, I am. And it's not funny anymore when you have to explain it. And, uh, and, and so, uh, <laughs> it's like yesterday I said, I told her, I said this joke yesterday about, um, because I, I, the kids like going to make up jokes. So I made up this joke. I talked about, uh, there was this thing on TV about the housing market crash. And I said, you know, a lot of people were worried about the housing market crash. I said, but horses weren't. And she says, why? I said, because their market was stable. And, uh, <laughs> and so, and that's what Bob Frank was original joke. It's all part of the My Thousand and One Pastoral Jokes book that I'm going to write at some point. And, uh, and she's like, I don't get it. <laughs> I'm like, because, you know, horses... Well, I guess you don't know that there was an economic crash because you were a year old when it happened. But anyway, I'm going to tell you about that. And so I tell her the whole thing. I'm like, so anyway, that's why it's stable. And she's like, oh, yeah, that's funny. That's good. I like that. I'm like, well, use it with your friends tomorrow. And, uh, and so anyway, so now the question is, so Naomi, Naomi gets this, this stuff. And she says, hey, here you go. Um, here's all the barley. And she says, well, the man's not going to stop working until the issue is resolved. It's like, well, how does she get, how, do, how does six scoops, by the way, that's 180 pounds of barley, six giant ephahs of barley, how does that mean that? Well, when you think about the creation story, God creates the world in six days and rests on the seventh. If Naomi had received seven ephahs of barley, she would have known that the matter had been resolved because now the man is resting. Because that's the message that's being sent. But because Naomi gets six ephahs of barley, she recognized that the matter isn't resolved, but that he's going to keep working until he's able to rest. And see, that's why he's, she says to Ruth, Ruth, don't worry about it. We're good. Because he's not going to rest until this happens. And there's something very appropriate to me, and, I, and I, I purposely skipped the fact that it took place on a threshing floor, and I know that that's not something common in our culture. Like, well, what in the world is a threshing floor? Uh, in the ancient culture, there would be this um, open area that was sloped. And what you would do is at the kind of the height of the slope, you would take all of your wheat, and then you would put it in a huge pile. And you would take what's called a winnowing fork. So if you can imagine a shovel that instead of a shovel looks like a spoon, but a winnowing fork is like a shovel that looks like a fork, and you would just take it and start throwing it up in the air. And you would just do this tirelessly. And what would happen is, is that there would be this outer shell that's called the chaff. And as you kept throwing it up in the air, um, the wind would come and would blow away the chaff as it began to open up. The wheat would fall in, into, on the ground where you're standing. And then down the slope of the threshing floor, there would be another pile um, of chaff. The chaff was worthless, but the wheat was all that was there. And so at the end of all your labor, you would look back and you would have two things. You would have the wheat on one side and then the, the chaff, which was blown away by the wind. And see, this is one of the metaphors that God uses to, sep to talk about the godly versus the ungodly, good decisions versus bad ones. In fact, in, um, in Psalm 1, it says this, that he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bring forth fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. You see, no, no, see that? That they're like a tree. This person who, who is following the Lord is like a tree planted by rivers of water. That they're, they're stable, they're immovable, whereas those who don't walk with God, who takes, to take God's commands as God's suggestions, they just get kind of blown away. And then it's like, well, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do the other thing. And, and it's just, they, they just kind of get, get blown away. And then some, and listen, sometimes our lives haven't worked out the way that we wanted to because can, can we be, sometimes we've just been investing in the chaff instead of being planted by the rivers of water. That's why there were relationships that we got into and they fell apart and we couldn't figure out why because it was chaff. I mean, there was just no weight to it. There was no substance to it. There are these hopes that we had that didn't pan out. There were, uh, there were dreams that didn't work out. And can I tell you, it's not because God doesn't want to bless you. I, I, I believe it's just the opposite. God loves you as a father loves his children. And, and listen, God longs to bless you. The real question becomes, are you in the place where God can bless you? Are you planting yourself, delighting in him, and saying, God, I'm just going to do, even though I don't totally get it, I'm going to do what it is that you want me to do. And see, when that happens, you start bringing forth fruit in your, se in, in your season, and all the stuff, well, I wonder what I should do, and just the chaff gets blown away, and all that's left is the stuff that's going to sustain you, 
nourish you, bless you. And that's why I think it's so amazing that this all takes place on a threshing floor to say, well, what are we going to do? Where are we going to plant ourselves? With what's real and what God wants us to do, or are we going to be like the chaff that just blows away? And see, here's what I believe. I believe that today can be our season. When the leaf doesn't wither, when whatever we, do, whatever we put our hand to does well because we're doing the thing that God desires for us to do. I believe that today can be the day that we put the past behind us and it becomes the day that we turn everything, that everything begins to turn around. That we can, today can be the day where God just begins to transform us and works in us and through us and where everything begins to change. Why? Because he loves you. He sent his son into this world to die for us. His son rose from the dead and now offers us life and peace and wholeness, forgiveness and grace. Why? So that we can live the life that he's created us to live. So we can spend an eternity with him. But listen, that eternal life starts right now. As we walk with him, as he walks with us, as he leads us and directs us, as he forgives us. So we can actually take the past and put it behind us and move forward into the future that he has for us. Let's pray together. And Lord, we want to thank you. Thanks for loving us. Thanks for the work that you want to do in us and through us. Thank you that you don't leave us in the past, but instead you allow us to put the past in the past and to, to go into what you have for us and what you want to do in and through us. God, maybe for some of us, today is the day that you want to transform our lives. And listen, as we're praying together, as our eyes are closed, I just want to give you an opportunity. If you say, you know, um, Pastor Bob, I want to put the past in the past. Maybe some of you know the Lord, but you've kind of wandered off. You've been doing your own thing, and, and maybe today's the day you say, I've got to get back. I've been chasing the chaff, but I need to leave that behind. And I want to plant myself by the river of water. I want to plant myself um, in good soil so that God can do a work in my life. If that's you, I want to pray for you. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm just going to invite you to lift a hand so I can pray for you as we close. See your hands there. God bless you. See some hands in the back. God bless you. Yeah. Hands all over the room. God bless you. All the way in the back. God bless you. And God, I thank you for every hand that's lifted because it represents a heart that is open. And I pray, Lord, that as they call out to you, that you would hear, that you would answer, that you would act, that you would do a work that only you can do. And let them leave the past in the past and embrace the future that you have for them. Those of you that uh, lifted a hand, listen, I'm going to invite you to repeat this prayer with me out loud. If you're willing, just say, Lord God, I open my heart and I invite you inside to be my God, to be my Savior, to be my friend. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. For I've decided today to follow Jesus. From this day, I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed the message. If today you want to take your next step with God and give your life to Jesus, we have a free gift for you. All you got to do is go to mycalvary.com forward slash begin. I also want to encourage you, share this message with your friends and your family, and also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. From all of us at Calvary, God bless you.